Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for QI Power Hour. My name is Tracy Sharon with the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, QI Power Hour is a free monthly webinar learning series. Uh, we bring together improvers from a variety of sectors with an interest in improving health and an interest in learning about quality improvement related topics. I am joining you today from uh, Health Quality Council's offices in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We serve all of the peoples of the province of Saskatchewan, which also includes traditional lands that are parts of Treaties 2, 4, 5, 8, and 10 as well. Recognizing this history is essential to close the gap in health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And we pay our respects to the traditional caretakers of this land. And uh, at this time of year, um, I always feel a little more attuned to the land as the, the snow starts to melt and we start to hear the, the running water of the snow melt and the land wake up again. And uh, just remembering um, how the land nourishes us as people and how as communities we nourish each other. Um, and I think that's very apropos given our, our topic today. Uh, so want to uh, encourage all to remember that we are all treaty peoples and we all have an obligation to take care of this land and each other. Uh, so, very pleased to welcome you to our QI Power Hour session today. Uh, if you'd like to check out this session later or past QI Power Hour sessions, uh, please visit our website. You can scan the QR code that's on this slide. I believe there will also be a link shared in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to go and check out uh, this or past QI Power Hour sessions on our website. You can also sign up for our mailing list so that you never miss a future session. Again, you can scan the, QI, uh, the QR code uh, on the slide or visit our website to sign up for the mailing list and receive notices about future sessions straight to your inbox. We are very excited to see the continued growth of QI Power Hour throughout our home province of Saskatchewan, in Canada, and even all around the world. So thank you so much for spending an hour of your var very valuable time with us and for your ongoing commitment to continuous improvement in the systems that you are each a part of. We are very much looking forward to your engagement and participation in the webinar today. We encourage you to share your questions, your insights, your comments, your thoughts during today's session by making use of the chat function. Uh, I, I would assume many of you have used it before, but if you haven't, you can access the chat function by clicking on the message bubble towards the uh, top right of your screen. That will launch the panel. It looks like the one on the screen uh, and you can enter your comments and questions into that. Uh, so please do so throughout the session. I will be monitoring that and we will have time uh, for questions and answers at the end. Uh, if you have the choice of who to send those questions to, please send them to everyone uh, so that we can all see them. So why don't we take a minute right now uh, and practice our use of that chat function. I would love to uh, hear who you are and where you're from, where you're joining this webinar today from. So please feel free to enter that in the chat right now and let's see how that works. And without further ado, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Jordanos Woldemariam uh, to talk to us today about social prescribing, exploring community-led approaches to improve health systems. Uh, Jordanos is a senior project manager at the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing at the Canadian Red Cross. The Institute is an intersectoral hub dedicated to bringing people, practices, and research together towards integrated health and social care with a focus on equity, community leadership, and collaboration. Jordanos is an accomplished public health and social service professional with expertise in community health, health equity, mental health, and chronic health conditions with a specialization in design thinking and design research methodologies. She has experience managing complex health systems projects and collaborating with diverse stakeholders to improve population health outcomes. She also brings over 12 years of experience working frontline in the health and social services sectors in Ontario. Yordanos, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Tracy, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. Uh, very excited to walk you through my presentation. And as Tracy said, we'll leave ample time uh, for a Q&A at the end. So really looking forward to this being an interactive uh, webinar today. But for uh, this morning, we have a presentation on social prescribing, as you know, where we'll be exploring uh, what is a community-led approach um, that's really focused on improving health and health systems uh, here in Canada and globally. 
and Tracy's done a wonderful introduction. But again, my name is Yordano Sold Merriam, and I'm the Senior Project Manager with the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing at the Canadian Red Cross, um, which is an, an intersectoral collaborative hub supporting a number of partners um, across Canada in advancing social prescribing initiatives, policy, um, and practice. I'd also like to start by acknowledging that I'm phoning you in today from my home office um, located on the Mississaugas, the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, uh, and we acknowledge the enduring presence and deep connection that Indigenous peoples have to this land. We recognize the histories of colonization, treaties, and the ongoing struggles for Indigenous rights. And as we continue to carry out our work here in Toronto and across Canada, we are very committed to honoring and respecting the land, its Indigenous history, and the ongoing contributions of Indigenous communities, and really striving uh, to be mindful of the responsibilities that we do have uh, to this land and its original inhabitants as we continue to work towards reconciliation and understanding. All right, so for this morning, we have a few areas that um, I'm excited to cover with you, but we'll provide a definition uh, for social prescribing, talk about the impact of social prescribing um, on physical and mental health, uh, its impact on our health systems, as well as what social prescribing looks like in practice. So to make this a, a bit more interactive, I want to welcome all of you to, to share in the chat one thing that you think is important for your well-being. And, and I'll be happy uh, to share my mind with you as well as you as you think, think through um, and get into a bit of a mind frame around uh, thinking about health a little bit more holistically. Um, but for myself, working remotely um, from home, getting outdoors once a day is really, really key um, and making sure that I am connecting with people face to face. I think that can um, easily be taken for granted when we're um, busy in our lives and, and working from home and loving the, the messages that are coming through, adequate sleep, exercise, good boundaries, understanding what's happening around the world, nature. Wonderful. Self-care. Great. Access to local food, gardening, working from home. Great. These are all wonderful responses. Getting moving, yes, yeah, staying active is very, very important. Wonderful. Well, I'll welcome you to continue uh, sharing in the chat as we go. And again, um, try to think a little bit more um, holistically about our health. Jeez. It's having a bit of technical difficulties here with the screen sharing. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much and sorry about that. I don't know if uh, there were any changes reflected on your end, uh, but on the slide that I have, um, on here uh, for you is Canada's social determinants of health. Um, so as you know, um, and as we all know, that access to, to formal health care is just a small part of what keeps us healthy. Um, so our income, access to shelter, food, transportation, and our experiences of inclusion or exclusion from community, whether that be due to stigma or discrimination, uh, nature and the built environment around us are all really, really important um, for us to be well, as reflected in many of your um, comments in the chat. So what is social prescribing? So this may not be a new concept for many of you, and you're likely doing this type of connecting either uh, informally or formally um, in your in your life and in your work. Uh, but what social prescribing at its fullest can offer is an intentional collaboration between health and social care systems, practitioners, and individuals 
and really creating a more integrated system. So prior it prioritizes and enables a person's ability uh, to determine their own goals and take control of their own well-being in a supported pathway uh, and really focusing on asking the individual what it is that matters uh, to them and co-designing uh, these solutions with participants and their clients. So on the slide, you'll see a more recent definition that's come out um, out of Canada um, on social prescribing, so a means for trusted individuals in clinical and community settings to identify uh, what a person when a person has a non medical health related social need uh, and to subsequently connect them to non clinical supports and services within the community by co producing a social prescription, which is a non medical prescription uh, to improve health and well being and to strengthen community connections. Um, and on the right hand side, you'll also see some key components um, of what we mean when we talk about social prescribing. So really focusing in um, on the person centered approach that are relational, um, integrated, holistic, uh, co created, and are evidence based. All right, so social prescribing and its impact on physical um, health and well-being. So as we as we know um, now more more than ever post um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is that social isolation can also have a very tremendous impact on our overall um, health and well-being. So uh, according to an advisory report that was released last year by the U.S. Surgeon General, uh, we know that a lack of social connection can actually increase the risk for premature death by as much as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day, uh, increase the risk of disease, including a 29% uh, increased risk of heart disease and a 32% increased risk of stroke, um, as well as increasing our risk for anxiety and depression and dementia um, with loneliness and social isolation increasing the risk for premature death by 26% uh, and 29% respectively. Um, so on this slide, you'll see key areas where social prescribing has been shown um, to have an impact on improving uh, physical and mental health. So from both the psych social, psychological, physical, spiritual, um, and financial um, and welfare components of our well-being. Right, so this image from the World Health Organization demonstrates what social prescribing can look like um, in connection with primary care. Um, so this is not the only doorway into social prescribing. Every door can be the right door, and there are many, uh, many social prescribing initiatives that originate from either secondary, uh, rehabilitative, acute care, uh, home care, and community sectors. Um, at times, the process of connection can be actually more important than the, the intervention itself. So strong social prescribing programs are able to support and promote um, a person's own capacity to, to determine their own goals and really manage um, what their own well-being will look like. Um, and this could look like co-creating arts-based initiatives as well as supporting uh, participant leadership. Um, and social prescribing really is a tool uh, towards advancing integrated care. So uh, connecting individuals, as, as mentioned, uh, to community and health services, providing intentional collaboration across sectors and practitioners. So really building those bridges between community um, and the healthcare system. Uh, again, focusing on that person centered approach and shared decision making in one's health and then measuring the impact of community interventions on health outcomes. So on this slide, you'll see the social prescribing pathway broken up uh, into four stages. So uh, beginning with the, the individual um, or family who's experiencing some non-medical uh, barrier to health. Uh, they may be disconnected from support systems, but also have unique strengths and gifts and goals. Uh, and it's their interaction with the, the health system, for example, like a primary care visit that can become the doorway uh, for someone to identify that they could benefit from additional support. Uh, then they can be referred to a community connector or a navigator or what's called a link worker in the UK and in some programs across Canada as well. Uh, the role of, of this connector is to provide a personalized point of contact 
uh, use active listening to really focus on what matters to the client and again co-producing uh, those goals and solutions with um, with the individual uh, providing supportive access to culturally appropriate and population resources um, and really helping to address barriers and advocate for their clients um, so ultimately empowering participants to take greater control over their own health care um, so that when they do exit the the social prescribing pathway they're more connected to their community and are better equipped to navigate uh, systems and resources um, and can manage their overall well-being and in the next next stage um, participation so once they are connected to the community they can participate in social interventions that will improve their well-being so this could look like physical activity social connection material supports like food and transportation uh, support to self-management uh, support related to their self-management of their health um, including behavior change with the connector then following up and checking in um, until they're mutually agreed upon goals are met and lastly, uh, throughout this process, evidence and data are collected to track these non-medical interventions to, to better understand um, the gaps, to improve services, and to really demonstrate the impact these social interventions can have. So this requires structured collaboration and information sharing uh, between health and community and social care systems. Um, and this piece is really critical uh, for social prescribing initiatives. This provides us with the ability to collect data and measure the impact that non-medical supports can have uh, on our overall health and well-being. Right, so we'll move into talking about the impact of social prescribing on our health systems. So measuring the impact of, of new health innovations, particularly those that are focused uh, on integrated care and our cross-sectoral uh, can be very challenging. Um, and what we hope is this gives you a sense of confidence that there is early evidence that is tremendously promising, um, so much so that clinicians, researchers, uh, and policymakers are investing in this practice as a way to improve population health and well-being. Um, at the same time, we're actively looking at a way to continually build the evidence base uh, here in Canada uh, to learn about best practices and to adjust and adapt uh, knowledge and implementation that is informed by the evidence. Um, and what our evidence so far is telling us is that social prescribing is a strong lever for us to advance the quintuple aim. So looking at improved patient experiences, better health outcomes, lower costs, clinician well-being and advancing health equity. All right, and as stated previously, uh, quantifying systems impacts on well-being can be very challenging um, and we have very promising results that have come out um, of the UK where research and evaluation um, into social prescribing is very mature. Uh, in Ontario, uh, research from a 2018 social prescribing pilot uh, in community health centres showed a 49% decrease uh, in self-reported sense of loneliness and a 12% improvement in mental health over a one-year period. Uh, this pilot also showed improvements in the experience of healthcare providers um, and that it reduced appointments for issues that could have been better addressed by community. So on this on this slide here, um, you'll see uh, some additional evidence um, and beyond primary care, looking into acute care, uh, a recent study was conducted of four social prescribing schemes uh, delivered by Involve Kent based in the UK. Uh, so this data was reviewed for patient usage six months prior to uh, a social prescribing intervention and then six months post for close to 6,000 individuals and showed a significant decrease in acute care usage and unplanned uh, patient stays. I'll just pause on this slide for a moment for folks to, to take a look at the data here. Right, so on this next slide, you'll see social prescribing evidence and gap maps. So uh, we are also starting to build the evidence base here in Canada. And if you visit our website at socialprescribing.ca, you'll be able to access this interactive evidence and gap map that was developed by Dr. Vivian Welch and Dr. Elizabeth Gokomu. Um, 
And the objective of this evidence and gap map was to identify different types of components of social prescribing interventions and areas of evidence, as well as any gaps um, in research related to social prescribing specifically um, for older adults. So through this map, you can view where high quality evidence already exists um, and studies and reviews exist and where there are um, some crucial gaps. So finding for findings from this um, evidence and gap map um, show that there are a few studies that have been conducted outside um, of high income countries. So again, uh, a need for further exploration globally on um, how social prescribing interventions uh, might improve health and well-being. Um, more research is needed um, as well around material based and nature based um, subscriptions or sorry, uh, prescriptions and then uh, in terms of outcomes. Uh, most of these focus on the individual level um, or health system outcomes with few really focusing on the impacts this can have on community. Um, and lastly, um, was future research really needing to describe or better describe empowerment as a part of social prescribing. So some really great learnings coming out of this initial evidence and gap map. And what's very exciting about um, this is that it can be built upon um, to or to focus on other other target populations using kind of the same framework that's been built in. Um, so please do take a look. I see um, Shireen, my colleague, has also shared uh, the link to the map in the chat. So do explore um, and take a look. We also had a webinar um, earlier this week um, going into the SCAT map in more detail, um, which we'll have um, posted soon. So please keep an eye out for that if, um, if you're interested in learning more. Great. So next, I'd just like to give an overview of where social prescribing um, is happening, uh, both globally and across Canada. So on uh, this map, you'll get to see a bit more visually how social prescribing is a growing global uh, movement. So the term emerged from the UK, um, where there are now over 3,000 dedicated link workers who are funded by the national health system and connected in every region um, attached to various parts of either their primary care, um, acute care, and community services. Um, and now there are more than 20 countries worldwide that are, that are adopting this terminology um, and practice from across different sectors. Um, in Canada specifically, we started on this journey of social prescribing in 2018 uh, with a pilot project in Ontario. Um, and that project demonstrated such success uh, quite early on and received a lot of attention from a number of stakeholders in Canada uh, that it started to snowball. So most recently, um, our partners at the United Way British Columbia are in the process of implementing uh, 90 and up to 100 community uh, connectors across the province to support their older adult um, support their older adult population. Um, and what's really exciting um, about these different initiatives across countries is there's so much to learn um, from the different geographies, cultural contexts, um, and how it's being adopted and implemented. So we'll, um, you'll find that there are some that are being implemented through the health systems in a bit more of a top-down approach, um, like in the UK and Singapore. And then within Canada, where we're really seeing a more grassroots movement um, that's community-led. Uh, leading uh, social prescribing initiatives across Canada. So um, we are also hosting uh, our social prescribing, our first so international social prescribing conference um, in September. So again, you'll you'll be able to, to learn more um, through that conference on what's happening um, across Canada, um, as well as globally with um, our partners who are, who are doing this work. So social prescribing initiatives in Canada uh, are continuing to grow today. So as I mentioned, many of these uh, programs are or initiatives are um, grassroots and, and for the most part community led with a, a range of funding supporting um, each of these initiatives. So from British Columbia, where we have the Healthy Aging Alberta, United Way BC um, and Island Health that are leading social prescribing um, initiatives for the older adults population. Um, in Alberta, we have Healthy Aging Alberta uh, that's leading a number of initiatives. I believe they're at 11 implementation um, projects, both in urban and rural communities. Um, um, so far and, and doing a lot of work around building implementation supports and training as well uh, for link workers um, and social prescribing initiatives. 
uh, here in Saskatchewan. Uh, more recently, you have the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism uh, leading in the early stages of implementing a social prescribing program. Um, and in Manitoba, there's the Manitoba Association for Seniors Communities, um, who are also um, getting some social prescribing initiatives off the ground. Um, in Ontario, as I mentioned, um, we have the Alliance for Healthier Communities and the Older Adult Centre Association um, of Ontario, who are uh, leading a number of social prescribing initiatives through community health centres um, and through um, seniors active living centers across the country uh, focus on a range of um, target populations so from older adults to to adults um, and youth um, with also a, a black social prescribing initiative um, as well that has been implemented over the past year or so um, we also have 211 um, and then st michael's family health team which is a hospital um, family care um, network who are who are leading a social prescribing initiative around older adults um, and then the McMaster Department of Family Medicine as well. We have a few other initiatives um, not noted here in Ontario um, as well, but again, happy to to speak to those later. Um, and then in Quebec, we have more recent um, emergence of a social prescribing initiative through the Eva Marsden Center. Um, Nova Scotia Health is also um, beginning to implement uh, social prescribing through their health system and uh, Newfoundland as well. So through the Newfoundland Health Services um, and Seniors Newfoundland um, organization. And that is it for uh, a bit of an overview across eight different provinces in Canada and looking forward to continuing to support our partners across each of these. So before I wrap up, I just wanted to give a, a bit of an overview of the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing. So as I mentioned um, previously, this is an intersectoral collaborative of the Red Cross, um, which was first developed um, by the Red Cross with the support of the Public Health Agency of Canada um, in order to support uh, people practices projects and research uh, on social prescribing across different sectors um, and regions to really come together to work under one big network uh, to learn and grow with each other and collaborate and celebrate um, what what all of our partners are doing around um, social prescribing. So we are very fortunate to also now have the support of private funders to continue to advance this work. Um, and our key areas of focus are really co-designing um, to work with a number of core external partners who together are co-designing and promoting a framework for social prescribing um, in Canada mobilizing um, communities and, and partners and champions and clinicians uh, as well as community-based organizations through co-design uh, engagement and knowledge mobilization. So um, at, at CIS we're working to collectively build the momentum for policy and practice change that can improve health and social care integration across Canada. Um, and lastly, CISP is part of a growing movement in Canada uh, to help address social determinants of health by building links between people, healthcare providers, and programs in the community and creating pathways to better uh, address health and well being. All right, and I think it's been shared in the chat a few times now, but you can visit the CIS website at socialprescribing.ca for more resources. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter to keep up to date on, um, on what we're working on and what our partners are working on. And there's also an events page where you can stay up to date on any relevant uh, conferences or webinars that are forthcoming. Uh, more immediately, um, we are in the middle of a webinar, a research webinar series. So our next webinar will be on March 20th with Dr. Kate Mulligan and Latian Bashkar, um, who will be sharing uh, their research on, pan on a pan-Canadian policy scan. So encouraging you all to sign up uh, via our website. And I think it's over to you, Tracy. Great, thank you so much, Jordanos. Um, generating a lot of uh, questions and comments in the chat, so I think we'll we'll get right to it. Um, there's a couple in here that I'm going to bundle together a little bit because I think they're similar. But one of the things that struck me uh, as you were talking about, you know, um, the various social prescribing projects across Canada and even around the world 
was it seems like a very um, kind of adaptable model to different contexts. I noticed in the on the map of the world, there are even different names for the function um, all around the world. And so, um, you know, one of the, I, I imagine there are like kind of standard components of the model, but those can look different dependent on your context. One of the ones that people seem to be most curious about is this idea of a community connector or a link worker. Um, and so if you could say a little bit more about, um, you know, what are some of the skills or qualifications required to do that, what that role looks like, um, and maybe how, if you have some examples of how that's been um, implemented in different places. Yeah, certainly. Um, so definitely language is a, a big piece of the conversation here amongst our partners as well, because the, the name for that connector role does vary um, not only across countries, but but across provinces here in Canada. So we're seeing um, other systems navigators, community connector, link worker, different, different names emerging for the role. But essentially, this person is able to provide kind of low touch support, so still relational and, and building that close connection with the individual, but less focused on um, kind of the acute um, needs that you might have a social worker or other types of roles within the healthcare system um, or community care um, addressing and really being able to focus a bit more on building those social connections for the individual, focusing on goals that are not just focused on kind of meeting the immediate either health or kind of crisis response um, needs of an individual. So the, the core competencies for a link worker, we're currently working collectively with our partners to, to develop a, a link worker um, umbrella framework uh, that can support uh, building out the workforce in, in Canada across each of these initiatives that's really in line with what um, these implementation programs look like in a Canadian context, because that does differ from, um, as you were saying, from country um, to country and, and region to region. So um, I think the biggest pieces are being able to build that intentional um, relational connection, having a good understanding um, of the population that they are working with um, having some previous experience within you know kind of the community and health sectors to to know how to um, you know whether it be motivational interviewing or um, working towards behavior change um, there's and and having a, a good sense of kind of um, equitable and um, anti-oppressive approaches to supporting um, clients and community so I hope that answers that question but happy to have you follow up yeah, it sounds as though it's a, a role or a description still kind of nascent, still being developed, but it sounds to me like any number of kind of different educational backgrounds or or preparation could be someone who could work as a link worker. Um, and perhaps there might be, you know, additional training or something uh, that's offered. And are are there any, you know, is there training available for people who take on this role or, or is that still developing as well? Yeah, so uh, Healthy Aging Alberta um, has a link worker training that they've developed to support their implementation projects. So um, that's one that we are going to be sharing hopefully soon uh, via our website. Um, British BC is also working on a similar link worker training to support their community connectors. Um, and then the Alliance for Healthier Communities, um, where they're supporting community health centers around social prescribing, have a more implementation focused uh, training that's coming out as well. And, and we're hoping to to continue to, to help support that over the coming um, year and, and identify what additional um, trainings are needed. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Lots of questions rolling in. So this is great. Uh, lots of great discussion to have. I think a few people are wondering about um, how this is, you know, funded. Um, so how are these positions funded? Are they funded by provincial health, pl health plans, outside sources? Um, can you shed any light on how that's been done? Yeah, so the most exciting one I'll, I'll note is in British Columbia. So with United Way BC, they've received funding from their Ministry of Health um, for 100 community connector roles. So they, United Way, is in the process um, of supporting implementation of that role specifically across a number um, of different community um, organizations uh, throughout the province. So that's what it looks like there. Again, it varies from context to context. Um, and then there are um, some private donors who are very invested in so supporting uh, social prescribing led initiatives. So in, in Alberta, um, Saskatchewan and um, a few other provinces, um, there's kind of private funding um, that is supporting some of these implementation projects as well. Excellent. Um, a couple were asking about, um, and I, I imagine this is probably similar across the country, you know, access to a family physician or a primary care provider can sometimes be difficult. Um, so do you, like, 
who can prescribe, I guess, who can write a social prescription or refer people to this kind of service, um, say if people are challenged to uh, be able to see a primary care provider regularly? Yeah, so so ideally any door is the right door. And again, this varies um, across different initiatives. We have some that are more focused on referrals coming directly from primary care, but then we do have a, a number that are really um, community based. So so being able to kind of get connected and receive um, referrals by just walking into you know a community, uh, whether it be a community center, a community organization. I know um, in, in Lethbridge in Alberta, they have um, six different organizations that work together. They go and um, put advertisements in their local newspaper um, to, to get folks um, engaged and connected. So I think multiple entry points is the ideal. Um, again, uh, a lot of these initiatives are grassroots, so we're working um, towards um, what, what the pathway really can look like um, across Canada. Excellent. Uh, okay, I'm just cruising through these questions here and they keep on coming in. So thanks everyone for being uh, so engaged and asking so many questions. I hope I can get to them all. Um, so, uh, I, sorry, Tracy, I just wanted yeah. to comment. I, I see sure. Krista uh, in Alberta, who's also leading a, a lot of the social prescribing there. So just wanted to, to correct a bit that there is government funding in Alberta that's also providing funding for, for projects there as well um, and not just through private donations. So wanted Excellent. to. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thanks so much, Krista. Uh, okay, um, so someone here is wondering about, um, you know, what uh, what uh, influence that the Institute has um, on, you know, politicians and being able to influ influence public policy in this area. Do you have connections to government or are you making inroads there? Uh, so if you if you can say anything about that. Yeah, so uh, well timed question uh, two weeks ago, I think. Just over two weeks ago, we um, had a webinar on a social and economic impact analysis that we work with KPMG uh, to develop to really look at what the social return on investment for social prescribing initiatives can look like in Canada at scale. So we are in the process of making that report public, and I think that's kind of uh, foundational along with all of these um, more recent um, research webinars that we're, we're putting out there to help support the evidence base around social prescribing and then to work from there on what our policy um, next steps and strategy can look like. So I think um, at an exciting time and, and in the early stages of what um, more intentional engagement with government um, can look like around policy change. Great, glad to hear. Yeah, and that answers the, the question right below that. Uh, has there been a social return on investment or business case conducted? So sounds like uh, yes. we should be be able to see that uh, shortly. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, so a question about, has social prescribing been integrated into any of the patient medical home teams? So I know that's uh, the model of the patient's medical home and primary care is one that I know many in Saskatchewan are interested in and, and being tested here, and I think across Canada. Are you aware of, of any models of social prescribing where it's actually built, been built into, you know, a patient medical home or, or family practice? Sorry, and maybe it's the language, Tracy, but yeah. patient medical home. So are, are you thinking of like home care, like supports being provided right. in home for, for individuals? It's so a, well, it's a, it's a, we could look at that too. Uh, the patient's medical home refers specifically to, you know, primary care. Uh, so where uh, a person could get um, kind of, kind of like a family practice clinic uh, run by a family uh, uh, family practice uh, physician or a nurse practitioner uh, with a, a care team uh, that is there to support the patient. So that's um, that's the model I think this person's asking about. But we'd love to hear about uh, uh, alignment with home care as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I think the St. Michael's Family Health Team is a great example where they provide kind of more um, wraparound supports as well for for clients. They're in um, the early stages of building their social prescribing initiative. I believe it's a five year um, project, but they have uh, built a kind of a community engagement worker into their role to help build um, community connections so that there is more of a referral pathway to support um, social prescribing initiatives. And then they have kind of a like the the traditional, more traditional primary care team model of having a nurse practitioner um, and other health professionals um, involved, as well as figuring out what that link worker connector role um, looks like given their already integrated approach. So I think there's lots of alignment with what's already being done and then figuring out how social prescribing um, and building in this community connector role can kind of take it a step further um, and building those connections. So I hope that 
gives you a bit of a sense of what's happening elsewhere. And then around home care. So in BC, they are also very much focused. Um, I think they have a better at homes program um, where their, um, I think social prescribing initiatives are quite complementary. So I think there's a lot of um, intentional work being done at a local um, and regional level to figure out how social prescribing can kind of support across existing um, areas of focus. Great. Um, folks are curious about how much emphasis on housing is incorporated into a social prescribing model. Yeah, I I would say again it, it varies depending on um, and again as as this we're not focused on implementation. It is more our regional partners who are uh, responding to kind of the more um, immediate needs um, of their communities. And I think what um, we're hearing is being seen is that just given kind of the, the current state of, of the world and, and the economy and, and challenges folks that are facing um, are more acute. So we do have a lot of um, link workers who are having to support around, you know, um, basic needs and, and housing support and financial support and and um, kind of acute mental health support. So I think, um, again, varies depending on region, but a critical component of addressing social determinants of health um, as well. Right. And a, a related question to that, a, a couple of people have asked. Um, so it sounds like a lot of uh, work has been done around supporting seniors or older adults. Um, are there other populations um, that can be well served by this model or maybe have been um, in some of the different implementations across the country? Um, and maybe if you could give a couple ex of examples of those as well. Yeah, so in uh, in Ontario, it's not not specifically focused around older adults, um, more so in, in BC and Alberta currently, but I know there's interest in, in expanding that more broadly um, to other um, population groups. Um, I, I think I mentioned it previously, but the um, Alliance for Healthier Communities through yeah. their um, social prescribing funding have, I believe, five um, black focused social prescribing initiatives. So really having a wonderful um, equity lens to the work and seeing how um, social prescribing initiatives can be adapted to more specific um, more specific um, population groups. So um, we we also and, and I know it's not released yet, but in the in the KPMG um, report that's coming out, we did have um, a focus area around youth mental health. So um, seeing how social prescribing can support existing initiatives that are really already doing a lot of that wraparound support that really model and resemble um, social prescribing um, and, and how it can be impacted there. We're seeing that globally as well, um, that greater focus on um, on youth mental health as well as as a, an area of influence and impact. Um, and I see here someone is asking about the social return on investment, the KPMG report, and if they can have a copy of it. So I'm hearing from you, it's not uh, released yet, but I, I can offer, you know, watch the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing website, um, and I'm sure it will be posted there when it is available. Yes. Great. Um, a great example here, uh, just looking for the name from Michelle, um, who's commented as dietitians, nurses, mental health counselors working in family practice in Ontario family health teams. We often provide social prescriptions in our efforts to facilitate behavioral changes and improve both physical and mental health outcomes. So sounds like, you know, even some good, some great work happening um, uh, in Ontario related to that. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions about how this works in smaller communities. Um, so, you know, how does this look in communities that may not have maybe a lot of services in the community, not a lot of access to basics? They've said, you know, for example, fruit and vegetables, uh, fresh fresh food. Um, how have you seen that work well in, in smaller communities? Yeah, I think um, I, I think there's our some of our partners would be better positioned to to answer what that's looking like locally. Um, and I know I know Chris. I don't know if she's dropped off, but if she wanted to share in the chat as well, sure. but they've implemented a few more um, social prescribing um, initiatives in more rural communities in Alberta. Um, and I think there's um, hopefully some early learnings that'll emerge from from what that looks like here in Canada. Um, but uh, social prescribing kind of in its essence is really meant to be applied um, in any any context. So um, I think a big part of implementing a social prescribing initiatives is uh, doing some of that asset mapping early on to identify what um, the strengths are within the community. What are the available resources that can be um, 
built upon and then and then where are the gaps and then working working kind of up from there so models can can look different you could have maybe you don't need a full-time link worker maybe you need a part-time link worker maybe um, you know there's other roles within um, a community that can play that referral role that are not kind of the the link worker per se um, so I think there's there's lots to learn on on what's happening um, currently and, and hopefully as we kind of collectively uh, learn from those initiatives will have uh, a better sense of, you know, higher level guidance on, um, you know, rural communities and urban communities and, and how social prescribing has been effective there. Yeah, it strikes me that that may also be an opportunity for at least closely located communities to work together, perhaps collectively, um, to offer a basket of services that maybe any one of them can't offer alone, uh, but maybe can work work together to to offer as a collective. Great, and thanks, Krista. I see she shared her oh, email. Here we go um, in the chat. Excellent. Thank you so much, Krista. So it is in the chat. If folks would like to reach out and to learn more, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, are there any examples of social prescribing related to connection to culture? So they are working in partnership with local tribal councils and curious to know if there are examples of what that could look like. Yeah, again, I think um, our partners in BC are doing a bit more work, working closely with their Indigenous communities there. I can't speak uh, specifically on the details. I know that we at CISP are working closely um, with our Office of Indigenous Relations to um, understand better how social prescribing can complement and support kind of um, you know indigenous determinants of health and existing practices on on um, health and wellness within indigenous communities. So um, we're excited to hopefully be able to to share some of those learnings and conversations, um, whether that be you know later in the year um, around our conference or through other external engagements. So that's kind of where we're at as CISP around. Um, uh, learning from and, and collaborating with um, our Indigenous partners and, and communities. Um, and, and again, I think I'd have to, to defer to, to some of our, our partners um, uh, across some of the different provinces who are working more closely um, on the ground. Excellent. Yeah, and I'd, I'd welcome any of any of those listening. Uh, if you have examples of what that's looked like or, or has looked like, uh, please do share those in the chat uh, so that we can all learn from them. A um, couple of comments in here, uh, and there's one I had read earlier about uh, dietitians, nurses, and mental health counselors. Another person here is a recreation therapist. Part of our work relies on social prescribing, but not seeing it being emphasized here. Is there a difference between how recreation therapists operate or integrate social prescribing? Um, so it sounds al also a bit like, um, you know, there, there are people who may be doing social prescribing, but by a different name. Um, so are there any, you know, important differences between that and what um, other roles or professions might do and social prescribing, or are they all kind of uh, similar? Yeah, so I think, again, this is a part of the conversation that we're having with our partners um, now, especially around working towards like, what is a link worker and what are the, what are the competencies look like for this role? And um, and we've definitely heard this before around the recreation therapist being um, kind of a, a great parallel for that um, yeah. role. But there isn't a specific kind of you need to be or have this background in order to work as a link worker. And I think that's what makes um, the, the role very exciting and that, you know, um, depending on the context, depending on, you know, where where you're trying and why you're trying to implement these um, initiatives, you can have a, a wide range of, of kind of backgrounds um, stepping into the the link worker role. Um, so I think in terms of, and I'm just looking at key differences um, between uh, the role, again, I think this is uh, adaptable and changes. You you could look at the, you know, core competencies that we're looking to develop with a link worker and say, these are all exactly um, fitting for that role, which is amazing. And I think what we're really hoping to do as we, um, you know, talk about and, and approach social prescribing is how does it fit with what we're already doing? Where are the, the places where we already have some existing resources that can be leveraged to, to support models like this that can help us measure the impact and benefit of focusing more holistically um, on health and well-being? So again, definitely ways to incorporate and make sure that, um, that this is a, an umbrella way of improving social determinants of health. 
Yeah, and I, I appreciate the focus on, you know, what are the core competencies for this role? Um, because as, as many communities, you know, struggle to attract and, and maintain healthcare providers, it really opens up the possibilities of who can fill that role or who could be maybe trained uh, to fill that role. So I think it makes it a very adaptable um, uh, position to many different contexts uh, to approach it in that way. Um, question here, and this is something I was curious about as well. Um, are providers, and I'm assuming what, uh, Michelle, you mean by providers is um, like primary care providers. So correct me if I'm wrong, I'm making that assumption. Um, are, are they aware of this work? Oh, she says yes, thank you. Um, and what steps are they taking to embrace these concepts? So um, I was curious about that as well. Um, uh, do you have uh, tips or evidence or best practice on how to engage with primary care providers about social prescribing um, that you can offer to our listeners? Yeah, so there's um, guidelines that had come out, I believe it was last year, early last year, from the Center of Effective Practice on social prescribing um, specifically for primary care providers. So um, I know that uh, the CEP are working closely with partners to develop kind of a a training module of some kind that can be socialized with uh, primary care providers um, in Ontario specifically um, around um, how they can implement and what their role can be um, in implementing social prescribing initiatives. I think um, a, a big part of the work is that knowledge mobilization and, and sharing and, and, and spreading the word around the benefits of social prescribing. Again, you know, if there's not a link worker or there's not, you know, that those are some of the things that you might hear is like, oh, this link worker sounds great, but we don't have one, you know, like that that doesn't exist within within our um, within um, our clinic or, or, or setting. And so I think a part of the work that we're hoping to do um, collectively with our partners, is how do we support implementation? How do we support kind of the early steps in um, building those collaborations so that there can be either, you know, the leveraging of existing resources that can um, be used towards implementing a social prescribing um, initiative or, you know, advocating for funding to to bring those roles in where they are, uh, where they are needed. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. And again, I uh, would offer any any with experience in that area to please uh, share your, your knowledge and experience in the chat as well. On that note, um, I think I've gotten to the end of the list of questions. I'll offer another uh, 30 seconds or so for folks to think of any other additional questions that you may want to ask. Um, also seeing a lot of gratitude for your presentation uh, today, Yordanos, and what you shared. Uh, so want to thank you for that. Oh, and we have had a comment pop up. That's great. Uh, Krista has commented, uh, they've been working in Edmonton with primary care networks, I believe is what PCN stand for, home care, hospital discharge planners, social work teams, and many other healthcare providers. And the program has been overwhelmingly welcomed by those teams. Uh, and I would imagine um, uh, it would be um, because uh, as you've shared before, many of us know, um, looking for ways to connect people with needs, with services that can meet their needs uh, would be very helpful. Uh, and some links being shared in the chat as well. Thank you, Yordanos, for that. No problem. This has been great. And, and thank yeah. you for, for everyone being so engaging and asking great, great. questions. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so uh, impressed by the amount of uh, engagement and questions in the chat. So thank you everyone for your engagement and for your questions and discussion and examples uh, and links. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, and again, thank you so much to you, Jordanos, for joining us today and sharing the presentation. I know there's a lot of gratitude in the chat and I want to share my sincere thanks as well for taking uh, time out today to share with us. Uh, I'm going to do a few quick uh, wrap up slides and then we'll be uh, done the session for today. Uh, so I did want to um, let folks know um, that the Health Quality Council Community QI Collective Cohort 6 is open for applications. We are offering a free six-month virtual quality improvement training opportunity uh, for teams in Saskatchewan that are involved in the well-being and support of individuals and their communities, um, and in particular, uh, those that support um, older adults. The training is meant to support teams in using quality improvement methodology to identify areas where improvements could be made, building capacity and quality improvement, and in developing measurement that is meaningful to them. Teams will be walked through useful quality improvement tools and given time to apply those tools to their project throughout the program. Uh, the projects are intended to be small scope, uh, so these are, are, are small scale projects, 
small scale changes that you can get some early wins with and then continue to use those uh, quality improvement tools uh, to make even bigger changes. And so I'd offer to anyone uh, listening interested in, in social prescribing and how you might do that in your community or in your clinic, um, this may be a program that can help you uh, work through how you might apply those in your setting. We have room for up to 10 teams uh, in that cohort and the applications are open. You can scan the QR code or visit our website and those will be open until April 22nd, uh, 2024. So encouraging uh, folks who are interested uh, to check that out and please apply. I also want to put out there uh, for folks who are listening, if you have a topic that you would like to share with our QI Power Hour listeners, we would love to hear from you. Um, and as a small token of our appreciation, we would be happy to offer a pair of highly sought after I Love QI socks, uh, just as, as pictured on the screen. Um, so if you do have any ideas, please share them with us. You again can scan the QR code uh, to sign up or to share your ideas. And your Danos, as a small token of our appreciation, you will receive a, a pair of socks as well. So please watch your, watch your mail for those. Um, we are so appreciative of our speakers uh, for sharing their knowledge and experience with us uh, and would welcome additional speakers to join us. We are hard at work on lining up uh, April's QI Power Hour, uh, so please uh, scan the QR code to register or visit our website, uh, and the topic will be uh, shared shortly. We're hard at work on, on uh, finalizing those details for our April session. And so with that, I uh, want to thank you, Jordanos, again for joining us today for the very informative, for engaging presentation. I want to thank all of you listening uh, for your engagement and your questions uh, in the session today. It's been a very lively session. We appreciate all of you and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everyone and take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.
All right, so next I'd just like to play a short video um, from a few of our social prescribing champions on the value of social prescribing. Sorry, I'm hearing that the video isn't playing. Colin, wondering if you might jump into support or if we need to skip this portion. Yeah, I was I was seeing it on my end. Oh, this is okay. Tracy here. Um, so it might just be some people for whom it was not working because I'm seeing others were seeing it as well. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure why it wasn't working for some and not others. Okay, it I will. It, sorry, it looks like um, we made it. I think most people made it about uh, to Dr. Park, so I'm just going to start it from there again. And then uh, you're down if you want to take control back. Perfect. Thank you, Colin. Right. So sorry for folks who weren't able uh, to see that clip, but you can also access it on the main page of our website. So again, at socialprescribing.ca um, for folks who would like to take a look following our session.